George. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your uh, to your students. And I was just telling George before everyone got on, and which he was not aware of, when I talk about Turtle Creek and um, the fact that it's I started it with two founding partners, uh, Jeff Cole and Jeff Habel. Jeff Habel actually uh, did a business degree at Laurier in the late 80s, and George uh, taught him at least one of his courses at that time. So there's a, a long connection going back quite a ways uh, with uh, the partners of, of Turtle Creek. So uh, in terms of who we are, uh, we've been, uh, we've, we just celebrated our 23 third anniversary we started in late 98 so um, uh, we're, we're now into our 24th year and if you think about that period it's funny until a couple of years ago I used to say we've seen pretty much every market we've seen the highest ever levels of market valuation in the dot-com bubble even higher than 1929 uh, we saw just a brutal bear market after that uh, you know we've seen a a, a normal bull market, if you will, more commodities related, uh, in, and then of course uh, the credit crisis and a and a true uh, epic crash, and then a uh, historically long bull market after the credit crisis, and then. Uh, but I hadn't thought of the other market environment, which is a a pandemic. So so now, in a sense, we've we've had an, another environment, and and one of the comments on that slide is that. In fact, in every single market environment, we, we have outperformed the market. Um, and, and, and so when I talk about our process and our approach, uh, hopefully you'll be able to understand why that is the case. And, and I would stress, we're definitely in the value investor camp. And, and if you look at the bottom of that slide, one of our corporate catch phrases is a, a different kind of value investing. And um, you know, it'll be getting too sidetracked to talk about how I think we're different than a traditional value investor. But I just I flag that for you that we absolutely, you know, I hate the distinction of growth versus value, um, and and I'll address that in uh, as we as uh, this evening. Um, so we're we're North American public equities. Uh, I was just saying to George, at some point the plan would be to to look at European companies, but. Um, we think it takes a long time to get to know a good company. And so if you think of Turtle Creek, you can think the first decade was really working our way through Canada, the Toronto Stock Exchange listed stocks. We don't look at oil and gas or mining. So it was a, a manageable number. Uh, and then around the time of the credit crisis, we began to look in the US. And at some point, we'll be, you know, we'll have diminishing returns of finding companies in the US. And we will start to look to, to Europe, to Australia, but not to China, not to Russia. I mean, there we need a you know a Western culture, rule of law uh, environment for us to to do the kind of work that we do. Um, we you know we do own large, well capitalized, as it says, profitable companies. The way to think of us is a is very much a mid cap. Um, we need to have. Face time and access to management. So the idea of looking at owning Google or, frankly, even a Berkshire Hathaway or anything where we can't have that uh, dialogue at critical points, it just makes it uninvestable for us. If you think back to when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, we were able to get on the phone with every single one of our companies within a week or two and really talk through what they were seeing and how they were thinking about the lockdowns and, and, and how they were navigating things. And, and, and of course, it helped us uh, think about our other companies in the portfolio based on those conversations with our CEOs and CFOs. Um, and that includes companies with, you know, that are $30, $40 billion in market cap. And so if you think of our AUM of $5 billion, um, some of these companies, we don't even own 1% of the company, but I would say that we, that we, in a way, punch above our weight, partly because there aren't that many active investment managers out there that actually really want to speak to management. I mean, I, that may sound crazy, but it's our experience. So often when a you know, head of investor relations for a big company kind of thinks about their top 10 or 12 shareholders who after a quarter 
should get a call with management, we're often on that list, even though we don't show up on the first page of Bloomberg in terms of who owns shares, because of course, it's not the passive funds. And many of the larger funds, um, some of them don't seem to care about speaking directly with management. Um, We've grown over the years to now eight additional professionals on the investment team from uh, the three founding partners and uh, and then 14 additional employees. And I should point out, Michael Bowen is on the call tonight. Michael is our most senior person on the you know the the the, the client facing side, the capital formation side of Turtle Creek, which is a you know for us an equally important part of the business than than as much as the investment team. I mean, of course, you need the the economic engine, but uh, for those of you thinking about starting a fund and 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 being a value investor, uh, you know, I'll warn you. Funds are not bought; they're sold. You need to have, um, you know, if you will, a quality client-facing people like Michael to to handle uh, all of that uh, illogic and inconsistency that that uh, that every investor has as a as a client. Um, and I mentioned already we've had good outperformance. The the point that that I you know really want to emphasize on the next. Uh, line is that our investment process is teachable. And uh, so while I and my two partners who started Turtle Creek did come from private equity, none of the other members of the investment team ever did private equity. They are all essentially pretty much fresh out of school. Um, and, and then the final point would be we genuinely take a long-term view. And so uh, we're in the, you know, maybe we're in a, well, I guess now we're in a correction for the NASDAQ, not yet for the broad market. But if we were to enter a, uh, you know, a, a compressing, declining, you know, dare I say, bear market, um, th- our focus would be on the longer term in the same way that when COVID hit and uh, and companies had to deal with lockdowns, we were, of course, thinking about the impact in the short term, making sure that none of them had any financing or liquidity issues. But otherwise, we were looking past the pandemic and, and still thinking out, you know, what's the what's the value of the company based on many, many years of cash flow, not just what's happening in 2020 or 2021. Uh, so that's a, you know, if you will, a, a bit of a overview of the firm. And I want to go through this quickly because, as I say, I I think the nine questions uh, really deal with a lot of this. But just to frame things the way we describe ourselves, um, we have a four-step investment process. Um, That first step is absolutely critical. I obsess on this, finding the right kind of company. And if you think of us today, we own 30 companies in, in the main fund. Uh, the flagship fund that that's where ninety percent of the assets are. Um, so thirty companies today, and in total, we've only ever owned an additional seventy seven companies. So in twenty three years, we've owned one hundred and seven different companies, thirty of which we own today. so it's 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 a pretty slow turnover in uh, in companies. and 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 I think the most critical decision that we make, uh, is which of the companies that we've identified, because I don't mean to suggest we haven't found more than 100 that meet our criteria, but which of the companies that we've identified that are, for us, the right kind of company, which ones do we then really dig in on? Because we do a lot of work on that second step of valuation and really getting to know the company and really getting under the skin of that company. And so um, so we, I, I'm... You know, one of the things I do is I obsess on this, not only f- picking the right ones now, new ones, but but constantly asking ourselves, are the companies that we currently own and are currently following, are they maintaining, uh, if you will, that extraordinary edge that we think they have? Because uh, companies lose their edge. It's inevitable. And so I often will s- say we're trying to find generationally great companies. The idea that you can find a company that will continually be great forever 
is uh, I don't know that there are any examples of that. So that second step is the classic, um, you know, present value of cash flows, and, and and that, as I say, is where we spend most of our time. Steps three and four, which are really, it's the step four is really step three over and over again, is really a differentiator for us, and it's a, been a value add in in every type of market environment. And frankly, in every every year uh, of our operations, and and I'll I'll get into this in a, in more detail later. But it's the idea of when we add a new company, sizing it to what we think is the right weighting. And and again, I'll talk about this later in more detail, which then leads us to what we think is an absolutely logical next step, which is if you think you've bought the right amount of a stock and it's the right weighting in your portfolio, and then the next week or two or month, the stock goes down by 20% and nothing's really changed. And that happens often. Our view is you can't just sit and watch it. You have to make it a bigger holding. But the, the equally, it applies if you first size a company and then the stock goes up 20%. You, you can't just sit and say, look, I was right. It's cheap. Because if you made it the right holding at that lower price, if it's gone up 20% and nothing's changed, it's become a bigger weighting and yet has a lower margin of safety, has a lower long-term expected return. And it's a it's a very logical thought, but it, it runs counter to the, uh, if you will, the traditional view of, of buy and hold. And uh, so again, I've, I have a case study, an example, uh, once I get past answering the nine questions of just taking you through a, a case study of how we've thought about a company over a multi, multi-year multi period. So with that, I will, um, I'll jump into the questions. So the first was, you know, what principles do we apply in searching of investment opportunities for study? Um, now, the sub bullet point there is we don't run screens. There, we're, we're trying to find uh, these remarkable companies. And, and it, keep in mind, this is before we conclude, or do they look cheap or not? This is just trying to find honest, really well-run owner mentality, founder mentality, uh, management teams and boards. And um, they're out there. They comprise a minority of public companies. Um, but like I say, they exist. And so if you think of our journey, the first decade was meeting everyone in Canada. You know, it's funny, I, I came out of both mergers and acquisitions and then um, private equity. I knew the names of all of the public companies, but I didn't know which ones would meet our criteria. And in that period of time, there are many companies that we identified, we still own today, and I think we'll own for a very long time. But to my previous comments, uh, in varying amounts, depending on whether it's they're really in favor in the public market or they're out of favor in the penalty box in the public market. Um, and so we, in terms of finding those companies, it's it's not like we have a checklist. It's a bit of a you know, there, there's it's it's more art than anything else. I'd say that we bring the fact that I and my partners have been inside hundreds of companies, either as advisors initially in our careers, but then as uh, looking at making control investments in companies, uh, and now now for many years um, looking at public companies. And sometimes it's just blindingly obvious that a company is remarkable when you meet them. Um, other times, it, it takes a while uh, where you're saying it could be really good, but you know they're saying all the right things. But are they really? Is that just they know what to say and know what to tell public market investors? Um, so I think we bring that scar tissue, that experience from prior to Turtle Creek. But uh, importantly, the the we're, we're, from a, a firm culture, what I've observed is we're able to to, if you will, download that approach and that thinking to uh, to people that never were M&A people or never were private equity investors. And I was walking past our boardroom two days ago and 
Patrick Zabeck, who's one of our senior people on the investment team, and, and, and Dan, another fellow on, they were setting up a to have a call with a quite a big U.S. company, a larger cap for us, close to 100 billion market cap. And I, and I, you know, I just kind of chatted with them a bit and I said, just think about how you're really going to figure out if this management team is thinking like that founder owner men- mentality. And we chatted about it. And, and so Patrick has that sense and, and intuition having um, invested with us for many years. Importantly, he knows how critical that that first step is. And so all of that folds up into owning highly intelligent organizations because this idea as an investor that you can figure stuff out, I, you know, I, I controlled companies, sat on boards, and I didn't know half of what was going on inside the company. And, and, and so the world's really complicated. And in the way that we say to our clients, you know, we're aligned with you. We think like owners because 100% of my family's wealth is in Turtle Creek and invested in Turtle Creek, and that's the case for my two partners. Uh, at the same, in the same way, we're delegating to remarkable companies um, with with our capital, and we saw it. We've seen it in different environments, but definitely saw it in the uh, in the pandemic so far. Just how they've navigated through uh, through what's been a it continues to be a very difficult environment. Uh, so, so that's, you know, they call it the principles and see, uh, searching out investment opportunities. And if, you know, we know we're going to find more great companies, but I feel at this point, I don't, I don't think we have to. We, we have a, a roster of, if you will, hundreds of companies that we've identified that are headquartered in North America that, you know, if we never found another fantastic company, it would be okay. But like I said, I know as we continue our efforts, uh, we will continue to find um, uh, more great companies to add to that that list. You know, some investment managers call kind of their their wish list of companies that if they got cheap enough, they would they would add to their portfolio. Um, and then the next question that was, what kinds of information securities are you seeking? So obviously, we're we're looking to own public equities. Uh, and I've mentioned already in jurisdictions where there is a, you know, a rule of law. I, I was chatting with a um, another, um, you know, I will say as a Canadian legendary public investor at a very big asset manager who've been very focused on Japan for a long time. And, and I was making the comment, I just don't know about Japan because, you know, if you take the traditional value approach and you say, well, here's the business. And then if you take away the cash, net the cash, look how cheap it is. The problem is if you never get the cash, it will not turn out to be all that cheap when you, you know, so that's something that we're very focused on, the cash that ultimately will come back to us when and how much. Um, And so that it's not just the rule of law, not suggesting there isn't a rule of law in Japan. It's that there's a culture of working for your shareholders. And, uh, and I think it exists uh, most strongly in the US, probably because of all of those activist investors you, you read about. Um, and, uh, but it also exists here in Canada. And in, in, a, in a way, over the years, I think we've bought, brought that US best practices to many of our, our companies in Canada trying to educate boards on the merits of share buybacks when it makes sense, um, just th- things like that. So, <coughs> so those are the securities. Um, and and in ki- the kinds of information, I've described it already, we just need time with management. In, in a way, we're, we're not, we don't have any specialties, we're not sector specialists. We might develop some knowledge of an industry because we own one company in the space, and that might help us with other companies in adjacent uh, industries. But, but really, the way I think about things is ninety percent of what we do is learning from management, and that's why it's so important to identify companies that are obviously truthful and honest, <laughs> but also uh, are willing to allocate some of their time to speak to their owners. 
there are public companies that believe they really shouldn't do that. They don't need to do that. And which is, again, not very shareholder owner focused. So uh, and, and then through that, we then go off, of course, and do a whole bunch of work on our own, but are constantly without over, without abusing it, circling back with with our management teams. And we'll go as deep into the company as we're as we're permitted uh, to to really understand how the business is is operated and what their strategy is. And and as I say, that 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 all of this is to develop a long term view on how the company uh, we think will 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 do. Um, oh, this is a good question. What kind of investor irrationalities do you consider? And say in a way, we don't consider any of them in our investment process. But one of the things that drew us to the public market from private investing is that there are so many investor irrationalities. And I was telling the, the smaller group of students this afternoon that when, when I was at Ivy in the early 80s, that was probably the height of, of the perfect market, efficient market theory um, uh, belief. And it didn't take me long to move from school to practice to realize it's just not true. That what I realized is if you give yourself enough time, a reasonable amount of time, just to get to know a company and, you, and you're curious and you ask questions and you think about it, it doesn't take long before you know that company better than many other people who are buying and selling the stock in the public market. So the idea that the share price is somehow reflecting all information, it just isn't true. And, and so, so we, we believe there are lots of irrationalities. And the, and the other point that I would make, and, and I think it's a, it's a positive uh, story for all of you as you're interested in investing in value investing, the great news is public markets are not getting more efficient. They're getting less efficient. And and initially, maybe you wouldn't assume that uh, when you step back and think of the number of people who are active in the market, the amount of the number of smart people, uh, the use of computers and artificial intelligence. I think all of those things are are in a way making things more inefficient. Uh, the the and then so I just have a list of them here. Some of them, but the obvious. The behavioral biases that uh, the psychologists and neuroscientists have written about and studied, uh, the fact that 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 short termism that is just human nature, it's getting worse because we're being we're inundated with news all of the time. There would have been a time when you, the only way you got your business news was from the newspaper, and now it's a constant feed. Uh, you know, getting a blast that Jeremy Grantham's calling for a fifty percent reduction in the market. And then who knows what the next um, news item will be later tonight. But then the agency effects that occur uh, as a result of the separation of people's money being invested and instead, rather than doing it directly, and they may not have been professionals, but at least they were trying to make money, allocating it to managers like us, but managers who might uh, be more focused on their business than perhaps the optimal portfolio for their clients. And of course, the fact that more and more money is passively invested, uh, it's not as though those groups are doing anything other than just uh, obvious, uh, hugging the in indices. So don't see any change to that, that um, or worry that... Um, Markets will become more finely priced, and it'll be harder to to outperform. Uh, that isn't what we see uh, in the market in the last twenty years as we've been active in in the public market. Um, and this is a this is an easy one to answer quickly. Um, what periods lead you to greater or lesser investments? And if I understand the question, it's more different environments. Do you do you have more cash? Or are you less fully invested? As long as we think the companies that we follow and own are risk adjusted better than being in cash, we don't ever sit in cash. We, we have never had more than 10% cash in, in our fund, except for the, at, the, at the top of the dot-com. 
where it was well above 10%. And that was, so we're trying to be fully invested. We're trying to be owners of companies um, that happen to be public and not worry about uh, volatility. But, and the only time we haven't been able to construct a portfolio that we thought was better than T-bills was, was back in 2000. So if we are entering a bear market, um, you know, I've warned our investors, we're fully invested today. And so it's not like we're sitting back with a bunch of cash, um, you know, hoping the market or thinking the market's going to fall. We have a, a large Australian family, lovely people, but one of the sons, one of their managers took a bet and went to cash just before the pandemic hit. And uh, he kept, you know, on update calls with us, he kept saying, well, these guys went to, why didn't you go to cash? And I said, you clearly don't understand what we do. We're, we're owning companies. We don't worry about the stock market. Uh, we just, again, view it as an opportunity to try to improve upon a buy and hold. Uh, so we're, you know, our job isn't to, to try to what's called time the market. In our view, it's to, it's to, constantly construct and reconstruct the best portfolio that, that we can from the companies that we that we know. Um, and then this is in the meat of our of our approach. How do we define and, and then estimate value? So for us, intrinsic value, it's there's only one approach for us. It's the present value of cash flows. Um, Michael Bowen, who's on the call, I mentioned, he has spent a lot of his career in the fixed income side. And so over time, when I've met some of his former colleagues uh, to talk about Turtle Creek, I've analogized to, to bonds. I've said, you know, in a way, we're treating uh, companies or stocks uh, the way they would think about bonds in terms of the yield to maturity. It's, it's when am I, you know, when am I going to get the cash? Uh, and I don't want to suggest that we don't believe the market is decently efficient in the longer term. So it's the classic short-term inefficiency, but things do settle down in the longer term. So as part of our construct, we are assuming that you know common sense kicks in over the longer term. But for us, the longer term can be five to 10 years. Um, but our value is, is that discounted cash flow value. Um, we do a lot of work. Uh, we try to be balanced uh, and all the things that are listed there, nuanced. And But the, one of the key points I'd make is we're not conservative in our forecasts. And that may be a, a differentiator with, a, with other value investors. Um, we, we, we try to get it right. If a company has a lot of growth, we're willing to give them credit for that. If they are great at making acquisitions and they have a lot of opportunity to do that and they create value for their shareholders, we're willing to put that into our forecasts. Um, now, but because we use a what I think is a conservative discount rate that we've never uh, altered and therefore haven't brought down in this period of low interest rates, um, we don't own or own very few software type companies today. Um, so we might have a very big forecast, which we do for a, a number of software companies. We're not afraid of tech. We've, we've probably historically been overweight software companies, not, not like zero revenue, big long-term potential, but real existing software businesses. But we're really underweight those companies today. And it purely, it's purely a, val a valuation issue. So uh, we might have a big forecast, but the market is either has an even bigger forecast or is using a potentially absurdly low discount rate on and far out cash flows. Um, so I, I think it is a, an important point that that our conservatism comes in later, but it doesn't come in to our development of of, of intrinsic value. And and as an aside, we use the term business value because over time I've been, when I hear some investors talk about how they look at intrinsic value, and I, I think it's nothing like how we're calculating intrinsic value. So we've we've searched about, we've tried to, another 
we used to call it cash flow value, but we've now landed on business value. And, and, and I think it conveys to our investors what we're trying to calculate. It's roughly maybe you can think of it as the, as the, as the enterprise value, as the takeover price of an entire company rather than the, the traded share price on, on any given day. Um, so that's our that's the answer to that question. And then not sure I quite got this, but I the way I interpreted it is we we don't ever look at comparable transactions. We never look at uh, what other companies trade at in terms of you know relative value. Um, for us, it's each company on its own. Uh, back to that idea of what do we think the cash flows are and what's the riskiness, the dispersion of outcomes of that of those future cash flows. Uh, but then all the other things on this uh, in this question, whether it's industry economics, strategies, management, uh, uh, the, the, those are all critical to the way we work and 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 think about about our about each of our companies. Um, and one of the points I make one way to frame our, our approach. We we act the way we did back in private equity. When we do work on a company, we we do the work and we think about it as if we were going to buy the entire company, even if we only end up owning 1% or 8% 8, 8, 8 of a company. Um, and again, if I understand this question is, do we try to explain the the disconnect, if you will, in the market. So you've got market prices, and then you have intrinsic values. Uh, do we try to account for that? We really don't. Um, we we just it's back to that comment earlier. We we just accept that the markets is the market, or let me say it differently: that the range over which a company share price could sit today, it's a big range. And I would look at it and say, that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, there is a this idea that there's one right price uh, is, isn't true. And so there are times when it's something's ludicrously overvalued. There are other times when it's stunningly, stupidly cheap. But most of the time, most companies trade at a at a price that it's, it's reasonable, it's justifiable, you could make a case for it. Um, but it's back to this idea of us trying to say, look, we think we've got a good handle on a, a balanced view on what intrinsic value is. And then uh, and then there's a price, share price, and it could be well above that view, which case we're not going to own it. It could be at our view, in which case we're still not going to own it. Or it could be quite a bit below our view, in which case it would it would be part of the portfolio. But we don't try to say, well, the market is pricing it here, but I think when they see these three things, they're going to smarten up and the share price is going to go higher. Um, it, it's not, we don't develop that as a part of our investment thesis. So, but again, back to my thought, we, we do believe for whatever reason, who knows what the catalyst will be that, um, that, a company share price does get dragged, sometimes kicking and screaming toward intrinsic value. So if our if our forecast for a company is reasonable um, and there's a big gap and margin of safety, given enough time, and this has been our experience for 20 plus years, the share price does get pulled toward it. Sometimes it happens quickly and sometimes it it takes years, but it does always. It does always happen. Um, and then, of course, the classic question about risk and, and, and how we manage it. You know, our view of risk is, well, first of all, it's definitely not share price volatility. Um, the personality of a management team can drive whether or not a share price is volatile. We've got companies where the management are so let even keeled, they never get excited. Um, and the share price, as partly because of that, doesn't move around as much. We have other management teams that, are, that wear their results on their sleeve. They get excited. They get down on themselves in an open, honest way. And that can really affect the share price. So it's not this market isn't this you know, ir, irrational machine. 
So it's not volatility. We think of risk as being wrong. You're having a forecast and, and ended up being, being too high. And so the way we try to manage risk is to know our companies, our, our investments as well as we can. Um, and then, of course, um, construct the portfolio that's decently diversified. Um, because I, I mentioned earlier, this is where I have all of my family's wealth. Um, and it's really just one, one, one portfolio. Um, and then really tilting toward the companies that have the biggest margin of safety, where it's really hard to imagine the share price not being a lot higher in, in, in five years. It's just really, really hard. And, uh, and I'll throw out a, a company that you would all be familiar with, because I know they are a big supporter bigger supporter than us of George and the work he does. Uh, and we wrote about this years ago in one of our annual letters, uh, Fair, Fairfax Financial. You know, Prem Watts uh, deservedly is very proud of his 30 plus year track record of delivering, uh, I don't know what it is now, but it's in the range of 20% compounded returns for his shareholders since he started uh, over 30 years ago from the IPO. The thing is though, if you had bought the shares in 1999, uh, and then maybe even to today, but it, for sure in the following 15, 16 years, when we put this in our annual letter, you would have made zero return. And it's not any a criticism of Fairfax. It's just buying in near the top of the dot-com bubble and the valuations that existed. You had to go 15 years before you ended up being flat. And so Valuation risk is the single biggest risk, I think, in investing in the in the public markets. It's pretty easy to build a portfolio of twenty five or thirty companies that aren't going to go bankrupt um, and then that are making money. The, the real risk is that you know let's use the, the 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 large tech companies today. It may play out like the the dot com bubble. You, you you know they do well in their operations for the next decade, but you may not 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 make make money. So uh, we're really, really focused on on managing that that valuation risk. And then um, I'm just trying to be conscious of time and look at how many slides I have left. Th this is simply uh, you know, I call it an educational tool that we use for our investors. that that green line is our intrinsic value. We've tracked it from the beginning. It's partly a you know, a point to make to investors to say, you know, we've never seen anyone else publish something like this. So, so we're trying to provide the tool. And if you think of the 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 COVID crash and you look at what happened to our unit price, and I'll, I'll point out this: the the unit price is on a log scale uh, over the years, so that you can see that the physical gap between these two lines, our unit price and our intrinsic value, you, you can take a ruler out and, and if it's the same uh, length, distance, then it's the same discount at any points in time over the years. But when we said to our investors back in March of last year with our unit price down this much, yeah, but we, we, we've done, we've scrubbed all of the forecasts, we've talked to all of our companies, and we think intrinsic's down about 3%, not 30%. Um, that was a tool that we gave to our investors that then allowed many of them, uh, to their credit, were scrambled to invest in March, April, May, through, through that period when the market uh, crashed because of, because of COVID. So, uh, and then you can see recently we've, we've had a, this year quite a big increase, which matched our unit price increase. Um, and, and so it's, it's just something that we're that we use as a way to try to get our investors away from obsessing on the mark to market share prices and provide them a tool that helps them think about how do, how how do we think we're doing in the shorter term um, and it doesn't work with everybody but it's actually been 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 pretty effective with with many um so how do we make overall portfolio decisions and, and asset allocations? I, I've talked about this a bit already. The first point I'd make is it's very collaborative. It, it's, a, it's a group approach with the investment team. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it's back to this thought of the margin of safety. The bigger the, the margin of safety, which if you flip it around means the greater the long-term expected returns, um, then it's going to be a bigger weight. But then that target weighting does get titrated by a whole host of other factors. Um, we do use a range of discount rates, but it's not enough to account for the riskiness of different companies or forecasts. So we do have a, a dispersion factor. Context is a big one. Uh, some companies we really, we've known for 15 years. Other companies are fairly new for us. So um, the, this raw cheapness is, is, is attenuated by these other factors that we turn into a, you know, a number. And, they're, and we're constantly or frequently tweaking these. What comes out of it is a target weighting. And, and it's just a guideline, but it helps us think about, okay, in the COVID crash, everything was down. What are you going to buy? And so based on which were the biggest buy signals, it helped us direct our money to, to the companies that were the, the most attractive uh, in terms of, of allocating uh, uh, the, the, the money that we had. Um, and so that, that, that's this process of constantly reacting to, to traded prices. I don't want to overemphasize it. It's an it's a, it's a icing on the cake on top of the foundation of, of a good value investing strategy of find great companies and get them into the portfolio at a really attractive price where a buy and hold over time should be really terrific. And then our view is hopefully we'll get this jagged price movement at times and that we can improve upon, improve upon a, uh, a buy and hold. Um, and so I'm going to do this quickly because I do want to open things up for questions, but just trying to talk about a case study to, to address some of George's questions like, you know, when do you not invest? Like what, and, and then when you do invest, um, um, how, how big a holding do you make something? Uh, this is a company headquartered in Cambridge, Ontario. And, uh, you know, I call it out as a, and this is a journey that, that a good investor has with any company. We've, this chart begins in 2004. So we've followed this company now, I guess, for 18 years. Um, and, but the gray shading on the, on the chart shows the percentage weighting in the portfolio. So you can see that in the first many years after we met the company in 2004, uh, we didn't buy a single share. So the, my partners and I drove down to Cambridge, Ontario. This is where this company is headquartered. It's a global business. They have 25 plants around the world, mainly in Europe and, and in the Americas. Uh, and they help large corporations uh, automate their processes, whether that's you know, systems or uh, uh, assembly lines, and they're really good at it. Um, this is a company that was founded by a, you know, an entrepreneur who, by the time we went to see the company, had, uh, had passed away. And uh, we did not understand the strategy that the company, the management articulated. So after a day of meetings, we put our pens down and, and, and went home and, and did no more work. Years later, there was a proxy fight in this period, and the board was changed, and then management was changed. And we, we had dealt with a new CEO before at a different company. So we drove back down to Cambridge and spent a day with him and came away thinking, now this could be interesting. And we began to do work, and you can see that's the green line. That's our that's our intrinsic value, and you can see how where it started and how it grew over time. So uh, when we first did our work, our conclusion was it's an interesting company now, um, but we didn't add it because it was the share price was above what we thought it was worth. What happened over the following year, you can see how we took our value up because they were turned the new management was turning the business around. And um in the meantime, the share price was going down. So classic case of value, our view going up, share price going down, who knows why. Uh, and we added it and made it at $5 a share, uh, probably a six, 7% weighting in the fund, which was a big weighting at the time. And all that happened after that is the share price kept going lower. 
It was the spring of 09. And ultimately, it stopped going lower at $3. And we'd made it about an 8 or 9% weighting in the fund. Uh, and if it had gone lower, we would have bought even more stock. So it's very much, we have no cap in terms of how much uh, we'll make a weighting in the fund, although it's rare. It's, it's really rare for something to ever become a 15% weighting. And that, that occurred not from us buying. It occurred from us holding off. We began trimming it at five, six dollars after we were buying down to three. Um, and then you can see how the, the shading has, has uh, changed over the years. You can see how the share price has changed over the years. And you can also see how over this multi-year period with a company that did, doesn't pay a dividend, we weren't taking our view up, which really means we were trimming our forecast. Um, it was you know a number of reductions. And yet recently now, they've, they're really, this is a company, I think, if you're not familiar with it, you should take a look at it. It's, I think it's uh, on a, on a, in a position, it's a 5 billion market cap now. I think, I think someday this might be a household name kind of Canadian company. Uh, the, the five years ago, the board just thought that the fellow who had turned the business around uh, wasn't the right person to really grow it. We we didn't necessarily agree with them at the time, and we were a big shareholder. And yet, in talking to the chairman and talking to the other directors, uh, my conclusion was they may not be right, but they're trying to do the right thing. And so, and they're doing a lot more work than we are on the inside. Uh, turns out they were right. Turns out that they, you know, they did a search, they found a superstar for growing the business. He's been there four years now. Uh, and the company is really firing on all cylinders, both uh, bookings, growth, backlog, revenue. Uh, they're targeted in, in some terrific industries, like a very thoughtful um, uh, from a sector standpoint. And they've been making some uh, terrific acquisitions and building out their their uh, their offerings to their clients. Um, so, and you can see as a result of all of that, after years of, of in effect trimming our forecast, we've really taken our view of value up in the last uh, year and a half. So, with the share price responding to the results, uh, you can see how we've trimmed the position maybe a bit, but really not very much. So, where does that take you? Uh, we've owned this company for over a decade now, well over a decade. And, and finally now, a buy and hold is terrific. Like, so you step back and say, we're trying to find companies where a, uh, if you had just owned them from the initial entry point, it would be pretty good. And as you would all know, 22% is really good. Um, but we've improved upon that to a return of 30% a year because of you know willingness to first buy it at five, but buy a lot more all the way down to three, but then equally trim it as it recovered and, and this fluctuation. And I'm sure there will be more fluctuations going forward over the years. Um, so we're gonna own this company, I think, for a really, really long time, even if we don't own any shares at a point, because it's, it is a bit of a sexy story. You could imagine this company trading at very high multiples at some point, um, we'll continue to, in a sense, own it even when we don't own shares, if that makes sense, in that sooner or later, if it were ever to become a truly halo stock, it'll stop, that'll stop happening at some point. So, and that, it, and I'm sure as you all know, the math of 30% compounded isn't just, you know, a third better than 22%, it's more than double better just through the nature of of compounding over a dozen plus years. And then the final point, and this is back to the point of, of not buying something, when we don't understand the strategy, when we doesn't strike us as a highly intelligent company, we put our pens down and, and if you had, but if you bought it when we first owned it, you'd only have a, a, a nine a 9% return uh, uh, from, from that date. So, I kind of met my target of roughly 50 minutes. So I think uh, I think I'll stop there and I guess open things up for questions. You know, in one of your comments there is 
I saw something that I love because I talk about this in my class as well. And you said that we love companies that target their optimal capital structure. How do you define optimal? How do you know what the optimal is? Yeah. Well, so there's no perfect optimal. And and I will say, you know, it's um, we didn't get to that question this afternoon, but I think one of the questions that the students put together was, has anything changed over the years? Um, and, and, you know, I, when I thought about that, I thought one thing we've changed is, <laughs> so you'll, you'll like this from a pure financial theory. I mean, when I was taught in school was, it doesn't really matter the capital structure a company uses because investors are rational and they will apply their own leverage uh, or cash against each holding. And when you get into the real world, you realize that isn't true at all. So that's one of the, you know, the pillars of, of you know, if that's modern portfolio theory or whatever component of it that is. Um, but we actually uh, took that idea And in the earlier years of Turtle Creek, we would say, look, imagine you have a company with that has a lot of debt capacity, has no debt, and has $100 million cash on the balance sheet. Well, okay, we'll value the business because the business value is whatever it is for whether they have debt or cash. And then, of course, you deduct the debt or you add the cash. But then we will apply homemade leverage against the against the cash. And we don't do that anymore in our thinking because what we realized is if a company's got strong debt capacity and has a bunch of cash and they're not doing anything with it, maybe they're not such a highly intelligent company. So, so that's, that is a change that's occurred for us over the years that the importance that we place on, on a focus on capital structure, but the way we think about it, we don't want um, companies doing what back in the early parts of my career, I used to pitch companies all the time. And I'm, I know Michael would on the fixed income side, these esoteric, complicated strategies to, you know, lower your cost of capital. So we want companies that use senior debt and equity, full stop. And in between, sometimes you know, convertible debenture, if that makes sense. So, so the way we think about it, and and our companies, frankly, are the same way. They they target um, every company's different. So, if we have a you know, we've got a, a company that are very good at acquiring and running uh, branded over the counter drug products. So, good brand but not prescription, but over the counter, mainly in the US, but also in Canada and Australia. Um, And they feel like that that business can handle five turns of senior debt to EBITDA. Um, The public market investors hate that, but but they believe it and they operate that way. And then there are other companies that target four, and we own uh, Service Corp, which is uh, uh, the largest funeral home or death services company in the US remarkable management. They were the, after the fiascos of all of the roll-ups back in the day, uh, these are the accountants who took over the company, um, literally, and they are extraordinary, really, really. Um, but they, they have a target of three and a half to four. And as, you know, in the pandemic, they, they said, hey, we don't really know what's going to happen. But now as they are below three and a half turns, they are going to buy back stock to keep themselves up in that range. And then we have companies like ATS Automation that uh, you know, used to be one and a half to two uh, debt debit DA, but now as they're bigger and more diversified, they're talking about raising that. So for every company, it's different. It depends on the industry. It depends on how big they are. But then we don't, well, we understand the company not being sl- slavish to that. Um, you know, in other words, refusing to ever let things fall below the bottom end. Um, because from up for us, when we think about the cost of capital, whether it's three turns or three and a half of debt, it's really not a big driver in terms of in terms of, of the cost of capital. So um, so we want companies to use debt but never imperil the business because of the level of debt. And we had a great example 
We own a company. It's one of our bigger holdings, Middleby Corporation. They're in uh, cookware product, whether it's uh, mainly in the restaurant chain. So they service 97 of the top 100 uh, quick service restaurant chains in the world. Uh, that Imagine what happened to the restaurant business or what people thought would happen to the restaurant business in lockdown. They also have residential, um, which is a growing part of their business. They own the Viking brand, the Aga iconic brand. The, uh, so they own a lot of high-end residential brands. They've built that over the last decade. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, people assumed all of that was going to go to zero because we're going into a recession. Um, turns out not. There's a massive backlog. People are at home. They want to renovate their kitchens. They want to cook. They have to cook more at home now. So, but that company uh, managed remarkably through this period. They they bought back stock. So they actually one of our the few companies that bought back stock uh, in the in 2020. To be fair, many of our companies, and I get this, took the view they weren't comfortable buying back stock when they were getting government aid, either directly as they were in Canada or indirectly as was happening in the U.S. It was more of a, you know, corporate citizen thing. And I, and I, and I completely understand where, where they were coming from um, because of how it would be interpreted and so or potentially interpreted. But, but getting to the story with Middleby, it was very interesting. They, they, when once the share price, if you look at a stock chart of it, it had fully recovered by the end of 2020, and they did a convertible debenture issue, and they did a very fancy cap and collar that I don't really understand the mechanics. It doesn't matter, um, which meant that it wasn't dilutive on the conversion until the stock was well above $200, although it's not far from that now. Um, the stock was north of only 100 at the time. And when we talked to the CFO, he, he said the following. He said, look, coming into early 21, um, there was a prospect for one quarter we might breach some covenants. Wouldn't be a big deal. We would uh, be able to get a waiver. We talked to our bankers. He said, what I worried about was that it would be a distraction. That it would, you know, we have so much opportunity. They're very, they're another one of our companies that are incredibly good at acquisitions. And so you can imagine the opportunities they're probably seeing in this environment. And they've announced a number of acquisitions. And, and his comment was, you know, think of him as an executive CFO, like a truly co-runner of the business. He said, I didn't want the management team to spend any time and energy having to think about or worry about covenant breaches, because there's so much opportunity for us right now. And so, yeah, there was a 5% chance it might actually be a meaningful problem. So he de-risked the balance sheet, uh, even though he knew probabilistically he probably didn't need to from a management distraction um, time. So it's that's the kind of granularity I, you know, when I talk about how we try to think about our companies, it's more having them tell us how they're thinking about capital allocation and and uh, and balance sheets. It's a really long answer, George, but I, I hope it gives you a flavor of how I think it's an absolutely critical element to to what makes a great company. Great. Uh, let's uh, now start with students. Uh, Osman. Yeah, thanks, George. Thanks, Andrew, for doing this. It was incredibly insightful. So my question is more related to the fund management side. So I was wondering, like, how the fund manages its liquidity risk? Because given that the fund is open-ended and the investors can come and redeem their amounts and that the fund takes a long-term strategy where its underlying portfolio uh, holdings may be very different than the benchmark uh, that it tracks. So given that especially in the market crashes, uh, like how does uh, the fund is able to convince investors to keep their money for the long term? Now, I understand that you explained that one way or one tool that you do is to like show them the difference between the intrinsic value to the to the actual portfolio and our value. But I'm just wondering like what other tools are employed there to manage the liquidity risk? Uh, well, partly it's uh, Michael Bowen and his colleagues' job, uh, which they do a really good job at, of making sure that the people who invest with us get what we do 
Um, and and I, I mentioned earlier, and it was gratifying to see uh, so many of our investors scrambling to to get money to get invested. Actually, they a lot of them scrambled for February of 2020 um, because if you look back, the market fell in the final week or two of February. They probably regretted that after what happened in March uh, in the COVID crash. But then a lot more money came in in, in March, so no one redeemed. Um, well, when I say no one, Michael, maybe one or two people redeemed because they were just panicking. But we have hundreds of investors. So part of it is we have a very diversified investor base. That was something that I wanted to uh, ensure. Like we don't have, you know, a couple of big institutions where the investment committee can meet and say, oh, I think we've changed our mind on this and we're redeeming. So think of it as, you know, close to 20% of the money is 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 us, is the employees of the firm. Um, so that's not going anywhere. And then and when we, you look at uh, investors, it's it's no one, as I say, we're the biggest investors. We do have some large investors, but they are the really smart money. Um, so I don't worry about them. And to your point of, you know, but if we, and it's not to say that we don't have net redemptions in a month as 2020 moved on and people got over the, you know, they we recovered and we were back to an all time high. There absolutely were people saying, uh, I don't think I'm made for this. Like this, like my stomach's turning. I can't sleep. I'm going to cash. And it wasn't about us. It was about being in the public market. There are people who just realize I'm not suited for that, which is fine. Um, we only have monthly liquidity. So that we're able to match off people who want their money back and people who are investing. And then we're very careful to not let the portfolio change. As a, result, uh, as a result of redemptions. So when we do have net redemptions in a month, in the final three days of the month, we are in the market uh, basically getting, you know, selling the amount of shares that we need to sell so that when the dust settles and the first of the next month begins, I as an investor, nothing's changed. You know, on a look through per unit basis, I still own the same number of shares of ATS automation as I owned before month end where money flowed both ways, either in or out. And because we own, you know, liquid, well, they're all public companies. Um, it's really not an issue. I remember back in the credit crisis or just after the credit crisis, meeting with this, these, uh, this family in, in Quebec City. And they said, you know, we were loyal. We were patient. We stayed with this hedge fund manager um, but what happened is other people redeemed and he sold the liquid stuff. <laughs> and he said, we've ended up with this portfolio that's, that isn't very good. And it's in some small, like illiquid things. And, and I took them through. I said, we would never let that happen. We would, we would sell everything. And we do sell everything on a, on a, on a, an aggregate basis. So, so it's a, it's a combination of educating our investors, having good investors who understand what we do. Um, having a really diversified base, maybe that's perhaps the most important thing. I'm giving Michael and his colleagues a lot of credit, but at the end of the day, if you know your biggest outside investor is you know just a couple of percent of the fund, and then it goes down from there, uh, you'd need a lot of independent decision makers coming to the same conclusion at exactly the same time. And and we're not only are they diversified, they're 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 all over the world, so uh, it's not like they can get together and decide all at once that Turtle Creek doesn't have it anymore. I think we should all take our money back this month. So I ho hope that's that's helpful. Yeah, it's, that's an, important, yeah, it's okay. an important it's an important uh, fact. It's an important feature that we really thought about when we when we set up the if you will the plumbing of the of the firm. We're we're unique as a mutual fund where we don't use the last traded price at the end of the month to set the unit price. We use the volume weighted average price for the final three trading days. And that's really important because then if you think about, okay, you know you have net redemptions because we need five days notice before month end for redemptions. So we know exactly, if we do have redemptions, exactly what that is into the final three days and we, if we know we need to sell 8,200 shares of ATS automation, we can give that ticket to the desk at, at RBCDS to a good trader and say, 
see if you can do better than the VWAP, which if you think about it, is going to be our net asset value for that month. So we've set it up so that there's no, the flow of funds has, creates no, no friction costs. And it's funny when we, you know, KPMG is our auditor. And in the very early days, the, the audit team, they said, well, this three-day VWAP, that's not gap. And, and I said, no, but it, it's better, right? And they said, oh, no, 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 it's better, but it's not gap. So if you looked at our financial statements for the funds, you'd see this you know, note to the financials saying, as of December 31, the IFRS unit price, I don't know if they use last trade or even a bid price, which makes no sense. Um, and that reconciles to the the unit, the NAV that we use, which is a, a three-day volume weighted average price. We, we thought a lot about these things because I had never owned a mutual fund personally when we started Turtle Creek. And so you know, when I kind of thought about some of the, you know, inefficiencies, the the problems of a, of, of a pooled fund, I think, we've, I think we've handled those. So there are a lot of hands here. Uh, so let's move on to David and then to Nitisha. Okay, David? Thanks for being here, Andrew. Um, I have two questions. Hopefully I'll make them pretty quick. The first is just regarding um, your principles and perceptions on the market relative to maybe market trends. And so if, for example, you're seeing your um, like behavior in a stock that you have a pulse on, but it's maybe not coming back to the right price, uh, do you kind of stay firm on your beliefs and your principles as a value-ask investor? Or do you dive in deeper and say, we're um, going to look deeper into this. Maybe the market sees something that our team's not picking up and try to meet some sort of middle ground before it gets away from you. And then my second question was just around when you're evaluating companies and working with management, is there something that's very attractive in terms of like today's market? So for example, ATS has been building out their corp dev team pretty aggressively. And I think that's done them pretty well in the past. Uh, is it like how companies are highly acquisitive or is there something else that you're really looking for as part of those growing organizations? Okay. I got the first part. Could you just repeat the second part of the question again? Yep. Uh, the second one is just in regards to, is there anything specific you're looking for in companies today, whether they're highly acquisitive like ATS or something similar that you just think is a trend that Turtle Creek thinks is attractive right now? Sure. Okay. So on the first part of your question, it's a great, great question. Um, no, absolutely not. We, it's back to, I spent a lot of time in the presentation part uh, emphasizing how I don't think there's any information in the share price. There's no information in the share price. If you, for us, if you put the thought together that when we talk to our companies and, and ATS Automation, the prior CEO, I don't know if Andrew Hyder, the current CEO, will has said he hasn't said it to us yet. Would he ever? I don't know. But the prior CEO said more than once, I, I like talking to you guys. I, you know, I get to bounce strategic ideas off of you. It's partly because of our backgrounds, partly because we just we have a good institutional memory. We and we hold them to account for what they've said in the past. <laughs> so so then then the question would be, well, if we own something like ATS and it keeps going down, like it has done at times in the past, um, it, does the market know something that we don't know? And if you if you think that you if you know that you've done at least as much work as anyone else, and way more than most. Um, the um, so it doesn't worry us. It's not like there's any information uh, being provided to us by the share price. Um, and also, you need to be comfortable that you own, you know, honest companies that, to the best of their ability, don't don't let any information leak out that they're not selectively chatting with certain shareholders. And you know, that might happen in certain sectors in Canada, who knows? Um, and it, it probably happens more often in smaller cap companies, but it's one of the reasons why we stress, you know, we want to own honest, well-governed uh, companies that, that, have, that treat their shareholders on a level playing field. And so now, 
Having said all of that, look, it's nice to um, it's nice to understand sometimes why the market's doing what it's doing. If you go back and look at that ATS share chart where I said, you know, we bought it at five, it went as low as three. I said at the time, you know, it's kind of the poster child for what we're looking for because what had happened is the founder had had um, he I think he was probably a very good entrepreneur. Um, but what he had thought is, look, I you know I'm really good at automation. My company is really good at automation, and he bought a solar plant in Lyon, France. Think about that. And, and I toured that plant once. I was on holidays in Provence and I took a day and drove up and toured the plant. I had I saw surly looking uh, French people stuffing boards in a solar plant, making solar panels. And I thought there's no way they can compete with the Chinese. Like that's just, that's not a good business model. Um, so they had that business and they also uh, had a small auto parts uh, business down in Cambridge, Ontario. Um, and so what happened when the company was then there was management change as I described, and uh, there was a lot of noise in the financials because the while the solar business was from our standpoint present value of cash flows was either worth a buck a share, worth zero, worth a negative a buck. You know, it turns out that the the Leon plant they got out of it for, like they got really lucky because Sarkozy in his presidential campaign to get reelected was actually at that plant and promised to protect all the jobs. So it gave ATS got out of France without having to, to make good on all of those rules that the French have. So they got really lucky there. Um, but it would have been a call it a buck a share. Like, and at the, that time we thought like the core business was worth at least $15 a share. So you know, what really mattered was the automation business, but what the analysts were focused on and what was really driving the, the results every quarter was the solar business. So, so I, I'll say absolutely not. We never worry about it. But come on, it's nice when you know why something's so cheap. Like, why is the market hating it so, so much? Um, but generally, uh, often you don't know. Like we own Discover Financial. It's a extraordinary U.S. so well run. They they're the fourth credit card. You got Mastercard, Amex, Visa, and then you have Discover, which Canadians aren't that familiar with because they the one place they really haven't ramped Discover is Canada because they bought Diners Club many years ago and they but they didn't buy Diners Club Canada. They bought Europe. They bought the U.S. Uh, anyway, it's a really well-run company. They reported their results two nights ago. Great results. It's trading at eight or nine times earnings. And, you know, I walked into Jeff Hable's office and I said, what are we missing? Like, to your point, David, like, what are we missing? A bit of a tongue in cheek because the stock was down 3% in the aftermarket uh, based on these results, which were really good. Um, but the thing is, when you look at the multiple that that stock has traded at, it's always been traded in the last decade at a cheap multiple. And yet, if you owned it in the last decade, you'd make better than 20% a year. So, you know, it, so my tongue in cheek comment was saying, wait a minute, if you own something that's cheap, even if it stays cheap, but their earnings are a lot higher over the next decade, you're going to make a lot of money, um, which would apply to many of the companies that we own today. So, um, I can't explain why Discover trades at a poor valuation, but it's okay um, because what will drive the share price uh, is results. And if the market changes its view on the company and treats it like a tech company someday, the way techs are valued today, uh, then it will do really, really well. But of course, that means we won't own it anymore. So I guess one way to frame it, our experience is there are always companies out of favor in the market. Even in the dot-com, um, you're all too young to know this, but the world was about to change completely. George will remember this. You did not want to own a bricks and mortar retailer because it's all going away. And it's going away 
tomorrow? Well, of course, it is changing. The best retailers have an Omni strategy now. We, we own Aritzia. We own uh, Urban Outfitters, which is you know anthropology, free people, and a remarkable company that did never overstored. But they understood 20 years ago, stores aren't going away. You just need to have a an omni approach and a social media presence and things. So, so then the bricks and mortar retailers, as an example, were uh, were really out of favor. We did really well owning the world's largest manufacturer of a of a technology called DVDs. So back in the dot com bubble, uh, everyone used VHS tapes, and there was this new format. Uh, coming on called DVDs. And and the internet bubble assumed that everything was going to be over the internet. Well, Netflix in the next eight, 10 years, their whole business model was mailing DVDs um, as a way for people to watch movies and to watch content. Now, of course, Netflix is what it is. So um, it's partly understanding technology change recognizing that at any point in time, there are companies that are in favor and there are companies that are out of favor. And for us, it's back to my comment. It's kind of nice to know why is something cheap, if, but it doesn't really, co- you know, it doesn't cause us to lose sleep at night um, because of all the things that I said. Sorry, did I answer both parts of your question? What was the uh, oh, no, 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 no? Yeah, the other one. You know that it's it, it's absolutely not. It's not like we say, "Hey, let's go find companies that we think the thing is now to buy stuff." No, it's not that. It's 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 taking our lead from our company. So if Andrew Hyder, the now four year in CEO of ATS Automation, in our next meeting said. I don't think I'm going to buy anything else. I'm not going to buy anything anymore. And here's why. That would be perfectly fine. But he did, you know, and to be fair to Andrew, he's never run a public company before. He came out of Danaher. He was running a a private company for a large private equity shop. And he got recruited. He's an American. He got recruited to run ATS. uh, And like I described, you know, he's, I think he's just uh, world class. But I wasn't sure at the beginning, right? It takes a while to get comfortable. We moved his family up to Oakville, um, so we, you know, this is his thing for the next many years. And as far as I can judge, I'll be shocked if if he's not with ATS in in half a dozen years. Um, but he's, it's his strategy. And if he had concluded that I don't think the right component of my strategy is to make acquisitions. That would have been perfectly fine. Um, it's it's what it's what management tells us, and it's okay if they change their mind based on new information. So, Alambadard at TFI International, that trucking company, years ago he told us he said, "I'm never going into the states." Well, why not? Well, in the credit crisis, my revenue went down twenty percent, but my margins didn't go down at all. So my bottom line only dropped by twenty percent. My competitors, they're good competitors like Knight Swift or Knight at the time in the U.S. Their revenue went down more and their bottom line went to zero. So why would I take my shareholders' money and go into the U.S.? Um, so, okay, that, that makes sense. He was by then the biggest trucking company in Canada, and he still is uh, by a large margin. Um, but now he's in the U.S. He's the sixth largest trucking company in North America. And when he made his first acquisition there, we said, what are you doing? Well, you told us this. And he took us through, you know, what had changed and what he thought the opportunity was. It was, it was about the last mile. It was about e-commerce. He bought a, a same day, you know, um, delivery company out of Texas that had a lot of Ontario business that he was able to backfill into his plant here in, in Etobicoke. Um, but then he got to know the management in Texas and decided this was a fragmented high growth business. And, and, and so it's not us saying we think you should do this. It's taking our lead from what they think and then trying to assess, are they, are they changing their mind because they don't know what they're doing, <laughs> which sometimes you worry about, or is it cohesive and logical? So again, we're, we're not, we don't have a bias. And I explained this actually at the, in the, in this afternoon with in the smaller group. We don't have a bias toward companies that are acquisitive 
we have an overweight in our portfolio to companies that are good at acquisitions because the public market doesn't give them credit for that. So the public market's giving little, if any, credit for the prospect that ATS going forward will be able to make further accretive acquisitions. They bought a, an Italian public company last year at a really, really good price. Um, and, and that got them solidly into a brand new vertical of food processing. So fresh food, food processing. And that company started as a, you know, crushing tomatoes, but now they provide beverage, uh, filling services for people like companies like Heineken all over the world. So really good company. And, and I know that Andrew had wanted to get into that vertical and he was in it in a little way. He's in healthcare and, and radio pharmaceuticals. He's in energy via batteries and electric vehicles. He's in nuclear de decommissioning with the can-do and now his first contract in the U.S. So he's very targeted in his strategies. But like I said, um, we take our lead from the companies, but we challenge them. If And if it doesn't make sense, at some point, we'll just vote it off the island. And trust me, I'm talking about the good ones. We've, I've, I can tell you stories about companies that we concluded over time. They just weren't as smart as we thought. And, and we've, you know, they're not in our, you know, list of companies that we're following today. But that, Andrew, uh, can, yeah. we, can, can we, because I see a lot of hands and we're, we're, time is running out. Uh, I'd like to move to some other students, uh, Nitisha and then Logan. Thanks, George. Uh, hi, Andrew. Thank you so much yeah. for spending time with us. So in your presentation, you stressed upon how important it is to spend time with management. And uh, George has been uh, telling us how important it is to, uh, uh, to know, know and understand the business before investing. So I was kind of curious to understand uh, if the conversations that you have with management are one-sided. Uh, I mean, with your experience, I would imagine there would always be an urge to tell them, you know, what the right strategy is, which you've seen in other companies or maybe otherwise in, an, in another industry that may just work here. And also in your uh, answer to David, you mentioned that you can you hold accountable, you, you hold the management accountable for what they had told you. So I was kind of wanted to understand how do you do that? Because I, I would imagine every plan would not be uh, communicated to you in written. Yeah, no, it's look, it's a it's a good point. So first off, I'd say it is extremely rare for us. So it is not it, it's we're not trying to tell companies how we think they should do things because we've seen it somewhere else. We, that is really uncommon. Although sticking with ATS automation, I can tell you with the prior CEO years ago, uh, we did say, hey, how do you compensate your sales people? Because we were frustrated that they weren't seeing the. So it's an extraordinary engineering cultured company, but they weren't getting traction with maybe with new customers or growing inside P and G. They had Gillette, but why couldn't they cross sell to others? And we weren't, you know, we did talk to them about, well, how do you, how are you paying your salespeople? Because we'd seen some terrific models in the private companies that we own. So once in a while, we'll have that kind of conversation, but I would describe that as being really rare. So the conversations are one-sided in that we ask questions and they provide answers. We ask questions and they provide answers. And then when I talk about we have good memories, the example of TFI International, the trucking and logistics company saying, Alain, you said you're never going into the States and you're just now you're buying this NASDAQ listed, you know, expedited delivery company. What's going on? And so it's more that to you know, hold their feet to the fire from what they have said, if it's a change. And if there's logic and they have new information or circumstances have changed, um, then it's fine. But I, you know, want to come back to emphasize, we ask questions and we listen. Um, it's not trying to tell them what we think the strategy should be. The only advice we'll give companies you know, un, unasked for <laughs> is back to George's uh, talking about you know, what we think we know about, like telling companies, 
Don't listen to the bankers that are telling you, you, if you have a lower debt leverage, senior debt leverage, you'll trade at a higher multiple. There's no evidence of it. <clears throat> we don't believe it. So <clears throat> that's something that we'll talk to them about, but not, not their business strategy. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Logan and then Jack. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for the uh, great presentation. <laughs> Um, I just have a question on like um, from the previous decades or two, we see uh, some examples of management misconduct on their uh, in terms of their financial statements, maybe um, maybe in order for a higher uh, profit level or some other specific purposes. And sometimes the management choose to cover to cover them up. And they are, to be honest, I think they are very hard for analysts to notice. And this will definitely negatively affect the performance of the portfolio. I'm just wondering, have you ever uh, encountered problems like this? And uh, during the talk with the management, uh, have you ever asked questions in terms of um, if you are if you suspect something, how do you respond to, to to problems like this? Yeah, you know. So the last time that happened, it did happen once. It was 2003, so it was a long time ago. And it was, a, a, you know, I loved the industry, um, and I dragged my partners into an investment based on all the things that the company said. Because it's you know think of specialty pharma um, years before Valley and pharmaceuticals and and others that idea of taking mature products and 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 really just focusing on them and and improving the sales that that can be a good business. Um, this company said all the right things. They weren't doing all the right things. And and I think there was some um, you know probably some very misleading financials. I remember sitting down with them when they came in to talk to us and they had already restated the prior year's numbers, but in the slide deck, it was still the old version. <laughs> so, and I remember being in their offices in Montreal with that sinking feeling of, oh my God, this is not, this is not what I thought. This is not good. We sold it. We lost a bit of money. And I think the company ultimately did go, did go under. Um, now, some years later, I've, we found a fantastic company in that industry, also based in Montreal, that, um, you know, it, they, I asked about this company, he said, yeah, they were terrible. <laughs> the, and, he, you know, it helped us understand them better. He said, I didn't compete with that. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how long it would last, but it, it actually didn't last that long. So since then, really haven't had that issue. You know, we do do a lot of digging on the financials. Um, and some companies, you know, try to tart it up in a nice way, but not misleading. And all of these adjusted numbers that are criticized often, they're actually well-intentioned in most cases because there are so many artifacts in, in US GAAP or even IFRS that good companies are simply trying to provide. In the way that we're showing that you know, change in business value or intrinsic value as a as information for our investors. We're not trying to say, "Hey, our, our this is our performance." We're just saying, "Here's here's information." So, um, it's part of that back to that thought of honest, good companies. If we get the sense that a company that we're doing work on is trying to spin and mislead, uh, that's that's a real negative and would cause us to 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 put our pens down. So I think we've done a pretty good job of avoiding that. I will say that over the years on some of our companies, there's some short sellers have attacked different of our holdings, um, arguing that there has been, you know, accounting shenanigans. Uh, and it just has it has isn't true. And it's actually provided us an opportunity to improve uh, because we get to buy more stock at cheaper prices. And uh, I remember a Dollarama, there was a short seller who, you know, had a bunch of criticisms that we read and thought those are all valid criticisms. We have the same concerns about Dollarama. We don't own it today. It's a great company from a valuation standpoint. But then he said, well, either they're really, really good operators or there are some shenanigans going on here because look at the margins compared to Dollar Tree in the US dollar stores. And I read that and thought, there are no shenanigans, and what an what an ignorant thing to say in a in a short report. Of course, he's just trying to to frighten people. They just have a different business model, and they're extraordinary buyers of 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 product. So a anyway, that that's uh, just haven't had that issue, and um, because we're I think pretty good at 
filtering at the at the at the outset. Great, uh, Jack, and then Ben. Andrew, uh, thanks again. Really great presentation. And I, I know you've held ATS for over a decade, you're saying. Um, and I'm really curious about kind of on average how long you hold uh, a company in your portfolio before uh, kind of realizing that position, or maybe you rely more on uh, dividends before then. Yeah, well, so ATS has never paid a dividend, and we and we we would encourage them to never do that. We're not we're not fans of of dividends. We, you know, um, in Canada, it's a terrible tax difference. Um, you're taxed much more on dividends and capital gains. In the U.S., there is no difference, and yet good companies recognize. Look, our, our investors who are buy and hold, they're way better off if we re- if we return capital through share buybacks. That they simply don't participate in, and of course, you end up with a, the equally high aggregate return over a, over a ten year period, and they haven't paid any tax uh, on the way through. So, um, so that's yeah, that's not. And sorry, the other part of the of the question, I just just kind of on average for uh, you. I know you hold yeah. a year or so companies now. Like, how long might you hold uh, so a company? The, the way that I mean, we, so we've been doing this for 23 years. We've owned Open Text, uh, another Ontario headquartered company, for 22 years. Um, we don't talk about it much anymore. It used to be the company we sp- I would speak about most because kind of not much happens. If you pull up a stock chart, it went from being one of the more volatile stocks we've ever owned, and we did really well on it. To it's it's the sleepiest share share price of any company we own, but. That is what it is. We we still own it, and if it remains cheap enough, will and it remains public, we'll own it forever. And ATS automation is the same thing. It's there is no exit. Um, it's constantly refreshing. Okay, what are the thirty cheapest stocks of the companies that we follow? And those are the ones that are in the portfolio. So Tractor Supply is a great retailer, specialty retailer. That we used to own, we don't own it anymore. We still follow it. Maybe someday we'll own it again. But with the stay at home and the pandemic, it's been on fire in terms of their, you know, sales, same same store sales. So, um, but maybe someday it, it it's what I said earlier. Maybe it'll be put in the penalty box and it'll be out of favor. When we owned it, the market was seemed to be terrified of Amazon and how Amazon was going to take all of their business, um, and that hasn't happened. So. So our time horizon is permanent holding unless we find something that, unless it's the 31st least cheap company, which means it gets kicked out because something else comes in. Our most recent removal in the fall was a company called Kushtard, which you may know, a wonderful company, fantastic, still in essence founder run uh, or at least co-run and we love it and we continue to follow it, but it just, when we added a new company we found that we thought was really cheap, we had to kick something out. We kicked out Kushtart. I would be shocked if we don't own it again someday. That as the shoe drops on gas consumption declines in North America, as is happening in Europe, at some point the market may take Kushtart and stop and putting the halo multiple that they've put on it in the last many years. But um, again, we think it's a fan, it meets all of our criteria. It just isn't cheap enough. So yeah. it's a it's a permanent time horizon in a way, as long as the company stays public. Right. So let's uh, have two last questions here from Ben, and then last question from Omar. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for coming. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I just had a question about uh, companies that do a lot of M and A. So specifically, like you mentioned that uh, a lot of the time the public markets aren't very good at assessing those companies and, you know, you view them as more discounted than some other and uh, than some others. And I just was wondering, you know, your opinion on the reason behind that. So why do investors find it, you know, maybe difficult to underwrite or difficult to value companies that do a lot of M&A versus if they're investing internally, primarily? I, well, I think part of it, and maybe this is the environment we're in, and it may not always be the case, but there's such an obsessive focus on organic growth versus what people refer to as inorganic. So there is, we own a company that is, you know, the flag highlighted is another great company out of Connecticut called SS&C Technologies. It's founder run, 
Bill Stone is a force of nature. If you want to be entertained by a CEO, he's our most entertaining CEO to listen to his quarterly calls or at a conference. Um, and he, you know, he he is frustrated with this because his point is, if I go and buy a few companies, which a couple of years ago he bought a bunch of things, my management team is going to focus on ringing costs. If I've got a hundred million dollars of savings because I bought a bureaucratic, poorly run company which is what he tends to buy. He's in fund administration, back office work and, and things like that in the financial industry. Um, I'm not going to have them out pitching fidelity on a new product. I'm, I'm going to have them get me that $100 million of savings. That's going to come back every single year. Uh, but if prices are high, which they are right now for M&A, and he's very disciplined, he's like their organic growth has gone from being very low to being mid, mid single digits, which for their industry is really good. So I think it's partly the market doesn't like inorganic growth. That's part of it in this environment today. And, and when I say acquisitions, I want to be clear, it's not those roll-ups. You know, the funeral homes chains were roll-ups and they all came ill. Uh, not a company that relies upon a high <coughs> traded multiple share price and they buy things cheap. And they, those are what I would call roll ups. We don't like those. I remember meeting with Veterinary Corp of America, which I think has now been privatized. And we said to the CFO, looks like you're paying higher and higher multiples for the, the vet clinics that you're buying. And he said, we are, but it's OK because we're trading at a higher multiple in the market. So that's not a very intelligent thing to say. And that's not the kind of company that is acquiring. We think of them more as true platform companies. And so I think the market doesn't like inorganic. And unless it's highly repeatable and done constantly the way Constellation Software, where the, the market builds it into their thinking, which in the case of Constellation, they do build it into their thinking and they get credit for acquisitions. But when it's ATS doing one-offs, they might do three in a year and then not do any for a couple of years. Those are the kind of companies that market doesn't know when it's coming. They don't know how big it'll be, so they can't forecast it. So they don't, they don't, they don't consider it. Uh, I think we're out of time, Jerome. I have to cut you off. Uh, what you send me an email, and I'll send it to <clears throat> to Andrew, and then you get an answer to your question, okay? Because I want to ask uh, two quick questions. Uh, before we let you go. Um, one is, I, I mean, I have a feeling that you never owned G. Um, has anything changed in your thinking about GE since Larry Kalp, especially since the latest announcement? Would you consider uh, a more uh, simplified, uh, more focused uh, uh, version of GE? So, so I don't have a view. I mean, I remember at the early days of Turtle Creek, uh, one of our companies was acquired by Northern Telecom. So this was in the, you know, 99, right? And, you know, I forget who said one of my partners, but I said, well, maybe we should, maybe we should take a look at North and at Northern Telecom. And I said, we're not going to look at a company because we're going to get their paper. Um, maybe we should look at it. And it turns out we never did. We actually sold it the day before we got the paper. So technically we shorted it a day before it. Now in pure hindsight, it turns out it was right around the all time high for Northern Telecom. That's not credit to us. That's credit for, we know what we don't know. We don't know anything about it. So now I think about GE, I can't get the kind of time with management the way I can with ATS automation. So for us, it's kind of an uninvestable um, uh, company. Now I, you know, I will say that we've been looking at Synchrony Financial. Synchrony was a, you know, was as GE was simplifying itself. Synchrony is uh, one of the spinouts from it, and it looks like a really good company, very well run, and it's of a size that we will be able to have access to management. So, you know, I, the way to think about us is we need as we grow our AUM. Uh, that gets us into larger companies. We have yet to see any correlation between market capitalization and market efficiency. It might be that the large caps like the GEs are more efficient or the Apples and, and things. 
I don't know because we've never we've never dug in on those. And like I said, only would if we felt we could have real. And I don't when I say time, I don't want to make it sound like we, you know, kind of get them in a room for a month. It's we string together a bunch of different times and over enough time, I feel like we are able to do the same due diligence we did back when when we could get a management team in private equity into a, a board, boardroom for an entire week. It it just it takes us time because you you kind of pick your spots. It's one on ones. It's it's calls. It's different people in the management team. Uh, Carmax had their investor day today. It, unfortunately, it's still virtual, but you know some of the people on the investment team spent the entire day. Uh, at that, including some one-on-one time with different management this afternoon. So it's those kind of companies where we're big enough that that we can have that access. It, that's so, and then I make a point of never expressing a view on a company that we don't that we don't know, like a like a GE. Okay, that's fine. And, and the last question, which I always ask at the end of uh, presentations, uh, what is the most important thing in investing and in life? that you learned over the last 30 years? That's a fully loaded question, I guess, yeah. but uh, just a short answer. <laughs> well, it's um, just find something you love to do, right? Um, it's, as you might imagine, as I, um, you know, I'm in my early 60s now, so I start getting questions and Michael has to deal with this with clients or potential new clients saying, what's the succession plan? <laughs> like I say, I can't imagine not doing this. I just, it's just endlessly fascinating. And, and so, so my children are uh, at university now, university age, and all I care for them in terms of, I want them to be happy is find something that you really love, love to do. It's just, it's, it's a nice uh, additional bonus that what I love to do allows you to actually make a lot of money. I, I told the story with the smaller group of students this afternoon that when I, I was, I did a science under undergrad and, and, but when I learned that you could actually just use your brain to make money with money, that, that just, that was something that really in, interested me. So um, yeah, but at the end of the day, you have to love you have to, you have to love it, and and um, you know I and my partners are fortunate that we that we just I mean I think of it as how can you not love the ability to to periodically sit down with someone like Andrew Hyder and his management team at a- ATS Automation they've got a fascinating business globally and uh, they've got a great culture and you get to in a sense almost soak soak that up whenever you get the chance. Thank yeah. you everyone. 